upon the spirit of wisdom among us so that everything that we are going to learn, it should bear fruit in our life. We quicken the, the footstep of our colleagues who have not yet joined also. Let them join in time. Father, Lord, give our pastor also the wisdom to impart knowledge into us so that, Lord, King of glory, we shall be the restorers of all the all the worst places on this planet. We pray and declare all this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have prayed. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. All right. Um, so today we will be looking at the last two chapters of Galatians. Uh, so uh, Galatians had six chapters. The first two chapters, Paul goes to great length to give a defense of himself and his gospel to assure them that what he is saying is accurate, that it is directly from Jesus and that it can be trusted completely. Uh, so he is so concerned that they should believe what he is saying, that they should get back to the true gospel. And so he takes entire two chapters to build a defense explaining about himself and his gospel. So that we saw in the first two chapters. Now, the next two chapters is where he tries to explain why we believers don't need to follow the Old Testament law anymore. So he gives various arguments regarding that. And he you know, finally concludes in chapter 4 uh, with that illustration of uh, uh, Ishmael and Isaac. And so he talks about how if we uh, wish to join God's family through legal entitlement, it does not work because even though Ishmael was legally entitled as the older son uh, to be part of the Abrahamic you know, inheritance, um, God says that he would remain the son of a slave. And instead, uh, God chooses Isaac, uh, who has been born to Sarah, and he says that the Abrahamic inheritance will come to Isaac. So the Lord was using these two persons uh, just to show that um, legal entitlement will only lead you to continue uh, living in slavery because you actually can never keep the law so perfectly that you can claim legal entitlement and say, yes, I have kept it perfectly now, yes. You know, declare me as part of God's family based on how perfectly I have kept the law. That's never going to happen for any of us. And so God wanted to demonstrate that if we are trying to follow the law, we would remain uh, sons of the slave uh, woman, children of the slave woman. On the other hand, if we just come to the Lord by, with, uh, you know, depend on his mercy and depend on his grace, we are not legally entitled to be part of, the, of God's family. We accept that. And we just say, Lord, because of your mercy, because of what you have done, please let me be part of your family. And then because we have believed in him, believed in the work of, cross, of the cross, he freely grants us this uh, sonship. And so he, uh, Paul ends with that illustration and he says, you know, those of you who are going on pursuing the law, you'll only end up as uh, sons of the slave woman. If you want to be sons of God, then you need to come like Isaac, uh, you know, just through the mercy of God, believe in him, depend on him, and he will just freely grant us this sonship. It cannot be bought. It cannot be, you cannot uh, do good works and legally entitle yourself for, uh, you know, a, a kingdom, uh, kingdom citizenship. So these are things that he explains. So if we are not supposed to follow the law, then what do we do? Do we just simply go around living in sin because now we have got our ticket to heaven? So that is what he talks about in these last two chapters. In, the, in chapters 3 and 4, he explained why we are no longer following the Old Testament law. But if we are not following the Old Testament law, then what do we do? Do we say to heck with all laws and we just, you know, uh, do our own thing? No, simply because when Christ purchased us, he purchased us for a purpose. And uh, so Paul explains what that purpose is. And then he tells us 
how we should be living because this is God's purpose for us. This is the reason why he bought us. This is the reason why he redeemed us. And so he gives details in chapters 5 and 6 on how we believers should be living if we are no longer under the Old Testament law. Now, there are people um, who say that because the old, old covenant has been um, nullified by Jesus and it no longer applies, we don't even need to read the Old Testament anymore is what they say. No, because um, um, they believe that the Old Testament has to do with the Mosaic law and therefore we have nothing left to learn from there. But that, of course, is a very uh, wrong attitude. It's quite a, an extreme step to take to completely give up the Old Testament. Uh, because when we look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, there you, know, you have uh, Paul explaining and saying, the Old Testament is highly useful to us. It, 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 it uh, reproves us. It corrects us. It teaches us. Uh, you know, and uh, so we need the Old Testament because there are many lessons contained in the Old Testament uh, which God uses to build us up. So we do not give up the Old Testament. We do not reject the Old Testament. We continue to read it because 2 Timothy 3.16, which is in the New Testament, clearly explains to us that we must continue to read the scriptures. And in 2 Timothy 3.16, when Paul was referring to the scriptures, he was obviously talking about the Old Testament because that was the only written scriptures which they had at that time. Uh, the letters and the Gospels were still getting compiled into their final form at that point of time. So when he was talking about scripture in 2 Timothy 3.16, he was very clearly referring to the Old Testament. So we do not discard the Old Testament. All that we do understand is that uh, the Mosaic law which is given in the Old Testament, that has been fulfilled by Jesus. He fulfilled it. He completed it and then he introduced a new covenant. So if we want to be followers of Jesus, then we would obviously follow the new covenant which he has introduced. We cannot go back to something that he has nullified and cancelled. That would make no sense at all. You know. So um, now having understood all of that background, let's begin Galatians chapter 5. Uh, if we can have someone read out for us um, up to verse... 6, uh, Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 to 6, please. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1 to 6. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will forfeit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to give the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision or uncircumcision avails anything but faith walking through love. Yes, thank you. Uh, so um, now we might have felt, you know, as part of the modern church today, that the first four chapters were very irrelevant for us because, you know, we are living in uh, uh, the current times where we all already know that we are not supposed to be part of the Mosaic law. And so it is all just head knowledge, a lot of information uh, which we might have found not very relevant but when we come to chapters five and six we really need to pay attention because this is talking about us our lives how we should be living on a daily basis so these two chapters are very very important this is the opening statement that we see in chapter five verse one where it says it is for freedom that christ has set us free stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Back then, in the in the time of the Galatian church, what were they, uh, you know, getting? Um, what were they being tempted to go back to? Uh, the slavery of the Mosaic law. Now, for us today, it may not be the slavery of the Mosaic law, but then there are other things, things of the world, which are pulling us away. You know, trying to draw us back into slavery. 
and so uh, we may not even be tempted to be enslaved to the mosaic law but then there are many other forms of slavery that are trying to draw us attract us trap us so we need to be very careful so here in where in verse 1 uh, galatians 5 verse 1 this is what paul says why did christ set us free why did he grant us salvation why did he redeem us he had one clear purpose in mind it is for freedom that christ has set us free so we should be careful to continue walking with him and not go back into the yoke of slavery to sin so that is you uh, know that 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 is the way that we would apply uh, this verse to ourselves um continuing with the with the you know thought which paul is trying to bring out here he goes on to say you know the mosaic law is of no use to you believers so he says if anyone is choosing to be circumcised he says in verse 2 christ will be of no value to you at all if you want to be a follower of christ and gain the benefits of the spiritual inheritance which christ is granting you then you need to be under him if you choose to be under the law and you choose to be circumcised then the benefits of christ's inheritance will not come to you you can't say that you would like both it doesn't work that way is what he's selling telling these believers you can't say oh i'll take these these few points from the mosaic law you know this thing about circumcision sounds really good i'll take that uh, even the one about the law about the about the sabbath that sounds really good so i think i'll hold on to that as well and you know these festivals about the new moons and um, uh, the 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 old feasts of the old covenant they are uh, part of our culture so i think we'll hold on to even those so yes i would like to follow all of that and i think that will you know gain me credit uh, and gain me salvation but yes i would like to hold on to christ as well because you know after all he died for me paul is saying if you choose to follow the law christ will be of no value to you at all you can forget the spiritual inheritance which is being offered by christ it will not even come to you because you have chosen to place yourself under the law he in fact repeats the same thing again in verse 4 he says you who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from christ you are now cut off from christ if you continue with this attitude you have fallen away from grace because what christ is offering comes through grace isaac the son of the free woman she he literally had to come into the kingdom by grace into the abrahamic inheritance by grace he didn't earn it it was just given to him freely so if these believers choose to place themselves under the law just because some laws seemed very attractive or are 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 part of their tradition then paul says you know what it's so serious you're actually going to alienate yourself from christ you'll fall away from grace and once you fall away from grace all that's left for you is judgment so please continue to stay under grace do not go back you know under the wrath and judgment of god so that's the very important point that he is making over here so in this therefore in verse 5 he says through the spirit you know through the holy spirit we are eagerly awaiting the righteousness which christ has promised us because he has declared that if we place our faith in him one day he will take us to heaven and there we will be like christ we will be part of the family this is a promise that we have been given um for in verse 6 for in christ jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love so a person if they say by becoming circumcised i can you know impress god and get his approval no circumcision is of no value to you on the other hand if a person boasts and says ha ah, you see i am uncircumcised i have chosen not to uh, follow the law so i am superior to you believer you know who got circumcised when you were a kid that also is of no value so circumcision or a non circumcision doesn't make anyone superior to the other believer all that actually allows you to gain salvation and be part of god's kingdom is this one thing faith expressing itself through love 
it's not just faith of any kind and variety that you choose to you know produce in your heart it's the faith which expresses itself through love it's a very specific kind of faith only people who have that kind of faith are part of the salvation experience which is promised in the bible if you have another variety of faith chances are that even though you've been attending church and tithing you are not part of the family of god it is only this correct kind of faith this genuine kind of faith which expresses itself through love that's the only kind of faith which can lead you to a salvation experience so it's very important to us what he means by this what exactly is this faith expressing itself through love what is this genuine faith uh, which is supposed to be different from a fake kind of faith um if a person let us say goes to a gospel meeting and um, they uh, the message which is preached is very powerful and they feel very emotional and they think oh my jesus died for me what a wonderful thing you know that he did and you know they feel ashamed about their sins and they think to themselves oh i wish i had not been living such a sinful way i wish you know i can become better i wish i can make a commitment to christ and they feel all emotional about it but while they are having that emotional experience if there is no repentance where they actually make a commitment and turn away from their past and say now onwards i have turned my back on um you know the uh, my uh, my past lifestyle and now onwards i choose to follow christ if that commitment has not been made then there's no genuine faith involved in what you know in 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 that decision it was just an emotional feeling that was there and then a few days later when once the emotions come back to normal there's no commitment because the emotions have now dried up so when jesus was on this earth and he was ministering when he went from place to place did he tell them you know get emotional about the kingdom people get emotional about the kingdom no he kept saying repent so repentance is at the core of this genuine faith because that is the kind of faith which expresses itself through love it's that faith which is saying lord i love you for what you have done on the cross for me i don't even deserve it and but but you actually sacrificed your son so that i could have a new life and so out of that deep belief that conviction and out of that gratitude that person says no more no more sinful lifestyle i turn my back on those things and yes lord i'm going to follow you and i freely accept the gift of forgiveness that you're giving me now that is a genuine commitment because it's not just based on emotion alone but there's an actual um, you know step of uh, action that has been taken where the person says i have turned my back on the past just the way jesus said repent i have repented and now i'm looking forward looking ahead to what jesus has for me so that would be genuine faith so uh, james actually talks about that and i think we would need to look at that uh, that will help us get a clearer picture there are things which are said in james chapter 2 the latter part of the chapter which makes us wonder who was correct was is galatians correct or is james correct because they seem to contradict each other but actually there is no contradiction when we understand what is being said so i think it's important that we look at james chapter 2 verses 20 to 24 so if we could have someone read out for us please james chapter 2 verses 20 up to 24 yeah i mean this is a classroom setting so you would have to participate in the class even if it's just to read out a few verses so if yeah please if any one of you could volunteer um james chapter 2 20 to 24 james chapter 2 verse 2 20 to 24 but without no of a man that faith without work is dead was not abram our father justified by work when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar. Hear thou 
Our faith lost its, its work, and by work was faith made perfect. And the scriptures was fulfilled. We said Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friends of God. You see then how that by, by work he might justify, not by faith only. Yes. Now this passage, if you just look at it at the surface level, it looks like as if it's contradicting everything that Galatians was trying to tell us. Because here in James chapter 2, verse 21, he, uh, you know, uh, James says, Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did? You know, and then it, it goes on to say in verse 22, His faith was made complete by what he did. And, but verse 23 refers to that scripture where it talks about belief of Abraham, not his works, but rather what he believed in. You know, in verse 23, it says, the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. So, um, yeah, they are obviously over here in this verse 23, referring to Genesis chapter 15, verses 5 to 6, which we looked at last time, where uh, God takes Abraham under the night sky and he says, look up, look up at the stars. You're going to have that many descendants, too many to even count. And Abraham, who doesn't even have a child, chooses to believe what the promise that God is making. And so it says in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, Abraham believed the Lord and the Lord credited it to him as righteousness. And so in James chapter 2, verse 23, the same thing is being repeated. And it says in James chapter 2, verse 23, the scripture was fulfilled. That says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. So James chapter 2 is talking about the Genesis 15 incident. It's not in any way, uh, you know, uh, discounting what was done over there. All that James chapter 2 is saying is that this man, Abraham, had genuine faith, not the fake kind of faith. Because he had the genuine faith, it showed up later on in his actions. That day under the night sky when everything was ideal and you know he was enjoying the night breeze, things were fine. It was easy for him to you know say, yes, Lord, I believe in you. But it was a genuine faith because later, you know, when there was no night breeze and you know he didn't have uh, the, the peaceful uh, uh, you know surroundings, when he was in the middle of battles, when he was in the middle of uh, faith struggles, at that time, because his faith was genuine, it showed up in the actions that he acted out at that time later. So if a person has genuine faith, it will show up later in your actions. Therefore, in James chapter 2, verse 22, it says, you see, his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. His faith was made complete in the sense that it proved, it showed, it demonstrated to everyone that the faith that this man had put in God was a genuine faith because his actions clearly showed that. His actions clearly demonstrated that. And so in that sense, the scripture which said that, you know, God credited his belief to him as righteousness, that was fulfilled. The scripture was able to show and demonstrate and, and you know, prove that this man's faith was genuine because later when he had to, when that faith got tested, it stood the test. He was able to hold on to God. And we know what, uh, you know, this is referring to. It's talking about his uh, experience where God, you know, says to him, go and sacrifice your son. So um, uh, maybe we could, you know, read out Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 to 19. Hebrews 11, 17 to 19, please. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be re reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead, and so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. By faith, Isaac yeah. blessed Jacob at Esau. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. 
that goes on to the next portion, which we are not touching upon. Sorry. Thanks. So yeah. Uh, so um, now see this Abraham, that faith which he placed in uh, uh, God under the night sky back then. That was a faith which expressed itself through love, because from that point on, you know, he re renewed his relationship with God. He continued to walk uh, with God. He made sacrifices to express his commitment. And so over the years, through all the different experiences that he went through, his relationship with this living God became deeper and deeper. He started to get to know this God experientially. When we first have our salvation experience, a lot of us, a lot of it is just head knowledge, you know, whatever the preacher told us during the salvation message, that's basically all we know. But then when we start spending time with God, when we start, you know, um, studying the scriptures, I mean, as we spend time in prayer, and even as we fellowship with other believers who tell us, uh, you know, things that we need to know, we start getting to know this God experientially. We, we, we practice what is being taught. And then we discover that God actually comes through for us. And so it's now no longer intellectual uh, knowledge. Now it is experiential knowledge, which, which you're personally experiencing with him on a daily basis. And a bond is established between you and the Lord. And so when Abraham uh, was asked to go and sacrifice his son, he's now been with the Lord long enough. And this love relationship that he has, he has with the Lord has reached a point where now he trusts God. You see, it's no longer just head knowledge of, of God. He has experienced this God in different situations. He's been through so much. And now, so he now, he, through experience, he trusts this God. And so he tells himself, under that night sky, God promised me that I will have lots of uh, descendants. But now the same God is telling me, go and sacrifice your son. Once I sacrifice my son, he's going to be dead. And there are going to be no descendants. So because I know this God, I know that he's a God of truth and a God of love and a God of faithfulness. Therefore, I'll just go ahead and do what God is telling me to do. I'll go ahead and you know kill my son. That's quite a horrible thought to even think. Because you see, you would have to take a knife and you know, slit his throat or stab him. I mean, probably he would just slit his throat because that's the most, you know, merciful way you can kill your child. So he actually gets ready to do that because you see, this is the reasoning that is there in his mind. Hebrews 11, 17 to 19 very clearly tells us what's going on inside Abraham's mind. This is what Abraham is thinking in his mind at that point of time. Hebrews 11, 19. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. So he tells himself, no problem. I'll go ahead and kill my son. Because God is going to raise him from the dead because God made a promise and God will never lie. God is faithful. So it's okay. I'll kill my son because I know for a fact that God will raise him from the dead because God promised me that I will have descendants from my own flesh, not from you know the, the slave. Uh, from my own flesh, I will have a descendant. And from him, I will have innumerable descendants like the stars of the sky. So therefore, he chooses to believe that he's going to actually kill his son and God will raise him from the dead. That is the level of faith that he had. So you see, this was faith, which was expressing itself through love. He loves the Lord and trusts him so much by this time that he's willing to just do what God is asking, even though that is the most painful thing that God could have been asking him. So why have we gone through this in such great detail? Why have we talked about this in such great detail? Because it applies to us believers today. There are going to be many times in our life where God is going to ask us uh, for the most precious thing. It's not a bad thing. I mean, having a son is not a bad thing. In the same way, whatever it is that is dear to your heart, it's not a bad thing. But God asks you to give up that simply because he doesn't want us to get attached to the things or the people, but attached to him because that is where actual satisfaction lies. As long as you're very attached to a thing or a person, there's no actual satisfaction because only God can fully satisfy. So all he does is, you know, why he does this from, from time to time, you know, where he asks us to sacrifice the precious things. It's just so that, you know, we, we get our focus off that thing which is so precious and back onto him. Our attachment deepens with him rather than towards that particular thing or object. And that helps us to stay in a stable way. 
no because when suddenly the thing is removed we will not fall we because now our bond with the lord has been established and strengthened even if the thing is shaken like that man who lost his entire family will say it is well with my soul i mean he stands there in the waters where his family drowned and he sings that song and he says it is well with my soul because you see his bond had now been formed with the with the lord he, the his family was not the center of his world the lord was the center of his world so god does this from time to time and we will be able to act like abraham and express our faith through love if we have developed that love relationship with him over the years it's not something that just uh, happens it is something that we cultivate so this is how a genuine faith relationship with the lord works on the other hand there's a fake kind of faith we see a good example of that in the same chapter over here in james chapter 2 uh, you know where james talks about the fake kind of faith as well james chapter 2 verse 19 so if we can have someone read out for us james chapter 2 verse 19 you believe that there is one god you do well even the demons believe and tremble amen the demons have faith that god exists that god is real the demons believe this truth so uh, you know clearly that it scares them it terrifies them because they know that this god is real and one day judgment is going to be coming so satan better win is what they're hoping because they know they know for a fact that god is real and is all powerful they've seen seen him acting over the thousands of years that this world has existed it makes them shudder it frightens them the reality of how real he is so they have faith but their faith has not led to a salvation experience because you see it is not a faith expressed through love that that belief that they have in god has not caused them to love god or be loyal to him or to trust him or to submit to him it's just an intellectual belief that they have so we believers are called to have a faith that expresses itself through love where you you know um, where you are gra- grateful for what god has done for you and so you start reaching out to him you start building your relationship with him and as you start doing that he starts putting his fruit of love patience kindness inside you and you start being loving towards other believers as well and by doing that you're now fulfilling the two commandments which you know jesus requires us to fulfill you love you start loving the lord with all your heart soul and mind and you start loving the people around you the same way you love yourself so that starts happening so that is the genuine faith a faith which expresses itself through love now um so uh, we were you know we were looking at uh, this uh, galatians chapter 5 verse 6 is basically where paul made the statement he said in jesus there is neither circumcision nor uncircumcision you know both of them have no value uh, so you can't say that because you're uncircumcised you're superior to the jewish believers who got suppose uh, who got circumcised when they were kids no uncircumcision doesn't make you superior in the same way so circumcision also doesn't make you superior the only way anyone can actually have a salvation experience and come into the family is through this faith which expresses itself through love now much later on in galatians chapter 6 verse uh, verses 15 and 16 paul makes the same statement again and brings in a new uh, idea so you know uh, we may in fact run out of time by the time we reach galatians chapter 6 so i really want to touch upon that right now Okay, so if we can just go to Galatians chapter six and read out those two verses, so that you know we can complete this thought about how circumcision and and uncircumcision don't count. Galatians chapter six, verses fifteen and sixteen. If someone could read out, please. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but a new creation. And as many as walk according to this rule. peace and mercy be upon them and upon the israel of god yeah so uh, you know he's already finished giving all the um, all the explanations which we have not yet gone through but this is him basically summing up the whole thing so here at the you know around the end of the letter this is what he again repeats he says 
So you see, circumcision doesn't count for much. And circumcision also doesn't achieve anything much. What counts is the new creation. Because if a person has that has placed their faith in God, and it's a genuine faith which expresses itself through love, if it is that kind of a genuine faith, in that moment when they place that faith in Jesus, Jesus makes them into a new creation through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, um, you know, uh, births a new creation inside them. So now they become a new creation, literally. And so this new creation lives in a particular way. It walks in step with the Spirit. We will look, we'll be looking at the details of all that a new creation does in Galatians chapter 5 and 6. So that is how a new creation starts behaving. So it really doesn't matter whether you're circumcised or not circumcised. What really counts is that you have, you have this genuine faith which expresses itself through love and you are behaving every day like a new creation, not like your old self which was crucified, but rather you are conducting yourself like a new creation. And then in verse 16, he says, peace and mercy to all who follow this rule. They have understood this truth that salvation involves faith which expresses itself through love and salvation involves you behaving more like a new creation day by day. Anyone who has understood, the, understood this, peace and mercy to them. Because you see, they are the true Israel of God. These um, Judaizers and all these other people who go on, you know, proclaiming and boasting that they are the Israelites, that they are the people of God. They are not the people of God, actually. It's these new creations who are the actual true Israel of God. So you and I, uh, you know, who are not even from um, Israel, we've all been born in uh, other nations, and we are basically what uh, they used to call us Gentiles. That is who we are. We are the true Israel of God. We are the ones with the actual privileges which, you know, God uh, promised to Abraham. The inheritance is ours. So uh, he's bringing out the beauty of what we actually have in Christ. And so he says, please don't go back to the Mosaic law. The Mosaic law can't give you any of those things. Christ is of no value to you if you go back to the law. In fact, you will lose out on everything that Christ has promised. Please hold on to Christ because you can only gain this inheritance through Christ, not by going back to the law. So that was the point that he was uh, making. Now let's move on to the uh, you know the next uh, portion of our passage. So we are going back to Galatians chapter five, and um, um, if we can have someone read out for us uh, verses thirteen to fifteen, yeah. Galatians five thirteen to fifteen. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty only not to use liberty as opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite or devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. Amen. Yeah. So here he says, yes, you have been set free from the law. But you have not been set free from the law to go and live a sinful life. You have been set free from the law so that now you can live in love. It's a faith which has to be expressed through love. That is what you have been set free for. So this is not a license to go and sin. You know, this freedom which you have been given from the law, uh, it's not a license to go and sin. Rather, you, have, you should now be serving one another humbly. Why? Because the entire law is fulfilled in keeping one single command, loving your neighbor as yourself. And of course, you know, you'll be only be able to love your neighbor as yourself if you are in the process of loving God with all your heart, soul, and mind. So, I mean, these two, you know, laws, uh, they go together. So, um, what is Paul saying, finally? Is he saying keep the law or is he saying don't keep the law? Because over here he says, you know, you, you'll be, uh, if, you, if you serve one another humbly, you will be fulfilling the law. But all along, we thought we were not supposed to be fulfilling the law, right? So what exactly is the, is should we conclude as New Testament believers, you know, living in the modern church today? Should we follow the law? Should we not follow the law? It says over here, 
that if we keep this one law, then we will be ful fulfilling the entire law. So should we keep the law? Are we keeping the law? You know, all these questions arise. All right. So we need to understand and may get it very, very clear what our stand should be as believers today regarding the Old Testament law. Um, Jesus, whatever he said regarding the Old Testament law, that is what we should abide by. Because now we see we have become followers of Jesus. So whatever he says, that we accept, that we believe, that we do. So this is how Jesus interpreted the Old Testament law for us who are going to be his followers. This is what he said. Um, there are some laws which he just completely abolished. Okay, That's the first category. There is a whole bunch of Mosaic laws which he just outright cancelled, nullified, not to be followed. You know, you don't even have to worry about them anymore. Um, one example, let's take... Um, Okay, maybe we could have someone read out for us. Uh, Mark chapter 7, verses 18 to 19. 20, maybe. Uh, Mark 7, 18 to 20. Mark chapter 7, 18 to 20. If someone could read out, please. So he said to them, Are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him because it does not enter his heart but his stomach and is eliminated, thus purifying all fruits? And he said, what comes out of a man that defiles a man? All right. So uh, that the term over there, thus purifying all that all the food or something. I mean, that's the NKJV. I don't have it here with me. I have the NIV with me. You know, NIV tries to explain what that, that small little phrase meant. Uh, so here in uh, the NIV, it says, in saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. You know, by, by making the statement, thus purifying all the foods. So this is basically Jesus, you know, um, uh, throwing light on the Old Testament command and saying, yes, you were given a whole bunch of food laws about you know what you should eat, what you should not eat, what you should regard as clean and what you should regard as unclean. Yes, you were told all those things. But have you noticed all those things are just externals? It doesn't in any way help with your internal uh, spiritual condition. Because a person can be very careful in eating the right foods they can be very careful about the ceremonial hand washing and the cleaning and all of that and have a whole bunch of hatred and greed and pride inside. So Jesus says, you know, have you noticed, even though the Old Testament law says this, the things which actually are going inside your stomach, you know, the pork or the uh, or the very, uh, uh, what, spiritually, um, Old Testament spiritually clean locust, whether you're having the locust or the pork, both of them go inside, they go to the intestines, and from there they come out. So actually, it's not doing anything bad. But actually, where is the dirt you know, coming from? In verse 20, Jesus says, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. And then he goes on to give a list of all the defiling things that are there in a person. And he says, all these evils come from inside and defile a person. So that is what is actually dirty. That is what you should be dealing with. So what Jesus did was he took Old Testament um, laws like this and he explained to them, he showed them that the Old Testament law was only able to go this far and was able to maybe make a point, was maybe able to teach a lesson, was maybe able to control the people to, a, to some extent, but it couldn't go all the way. So now Jesus takes many, many Old Testament uh, scriptures like this, Old Testament laws belonging to the Mosaic law, you know, the 613 Mosaic laws. He picks up certain things like this and he explains them and shows them how the law was actually not adequate. What he is saying is completing the picture. And this is what is expected from a follower of Jesus now. So in that way, he abolished a whole bunch of Old Testament laws, which are no longer applicable to his followers. You know, his followers are now called believers. That's what we call ourselves. But any follower of his would not need to follow these laws, which have been outright abolished. Okay, so now the second thing, there are two laws which he goes on talking about, very, very important to him. One is Leviticus 19.18. And the other is Deuteronomy 6 5. 
because those are the two you know commandments where it says love the lord with all your heart soul and mind and then the other one which says love your neighbor as yourself deuteronomy 6 5 and leviticus 19 18 when it comes to these two laws jesus is very particular about them you know we, we were doing uh, john's gospel most of you had not joined that for that class but then when we were doing that there's a lot of emphasis that he lays on these two commandments he says you got to keep them because when you do that then you will abide in me if you don't keep these two commandments you're not even abiding in me so he takes these two old testament laws he redefines them explains to us how we should be applying them in the new testament context again he you know some examples he gives he says what is there in the in the in the 10 commandments it says you shall not murder but this is what I am saying regarding this particular Old Testament commandment. It's not enough for you to just, you know, avoid taking a knife and stabbing someone. It goes much beyond that. You should not even be holding a grudge in your heart against a brother or sister because that also is equal to murder. And then he goes on to say, all this is happening in Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 to 30. Okay, Matthew 5, 21 to 30. He says, it was told long ago, you shall not murder, but I tell you. And then he goes on to explain what he believes is the actual complete picture of what this commandment means. So he goes on to say, you shall not call someone a fool. And if you, uh, he, he says in verse 23, if you are at the, you know, if you have come there to the temple to give some nice gift to the Lord, and then you remember that you have uh, something against another brother or sister, or they have something against you, put down that gift first. Go over there, reconcile with that brother because that is what is valuable to God. Then you can come back and give your gift because the gift is not the important thing. It's that living in love which is important because it, this is a faith which has to be expressed through love. So he, he gives new clarity to these uh, 10 commandments and all the other uh, 603 commandments because there are totally 613 Mosaic laws. Uh, so in the same way, I mean, uh, in verse uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 27, he takes another example. He says, you know, it was told to you, you shall not commit adultery. But this is my definition what, of what adultery is, and this is what I expect you to do. And he goes on to explain further regarding that. John chapter 7, verse 23 is, an, is another good example. Um, where he's talking about circumcision and he says, you know, according to the law of Moses, John 7, 23, according to the law of Moses, um, a child can be circumcised on the Sabbath day and it will not be considered as work. So if circumcision is not considered as work on the Sabbath day, then don't you think, don't you think that the healing of an entire man's whole body, uh, you know, it should also be considered as a good work and not as, you know, a, 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 a a work which comes under the law of Moses. The exact wording in John 7, 23 is this. Now, if a boy can be circumstanced on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses may not be broken, why are you angry with me for healing a man's whole body on the Sabbath? Because you see, under the Old Testament, that act of circumcision is supposed to purify you and bring you under uh, into the kingdom of God. And now, what is... What is Jesus doing? He's making a person completely holy well, releasing his crucifixion power into that person. So isn't this a greater act of deliverance than what that, that physical act of circumcision could do in the Old Testament? So what Jesus is doing over here is he's taking that Sabbath law, one of the Ten Commandments, he's giving it a new interpretation, he's redefining this old commandment and saying, you know what, the Sabbath law, Let's look at it in this light. The Sabbath law is talking about what uh, the deliverance which I can give to people. If you will, you know, set aside other things and focus on me. So he's been bringing a whole new meaning to this law of the Sabbath. So, uh, you know, before we get into the break, if I can just take one minute. Are we going to keep the Old Testament law as believers today? No. But these things which... Jesus has specifically told us to follow and the new interpretation that he has given to these Old Testament laws that we have to follow because we are followers of Jesus. Uh, we will look at a third category of Old Testament law, which we will look at after we come back from the break. So at 10 o'clock, if we all can uh, log back in, please. Thank you. <laughs> 